Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to our question lab. This evening's topic is physiology, and leading our session once again is Dr. Boris Vakaria, and he's going to introduce himself now. Boris. Hey, Sean. Uh, hey, guys. My name is Paris. Um, I'm a dermatology resident uh, here at UT Southwestern in Dallas, Texas. Um, I originally graduated from pharmacy school and then went back home into Michigan to do medical school. Um, I am uh, now doing my dermatology residency. Um, I'm also an RX coach with USMLE RX, so I work one-on-one -on -one with students such as yourselves uh, to help prepare you guys for the USMLE Step 1 and Step 2 CK as well. And I'm happy to help lead tonight's session. As you can see, the answer choices are covered up. That is by design. We do that because we don't want the answer choices to guide or dictate your thought process. And we certainly don't want the answer choices that you're unfamiliar with to cause you to panic as you're trying to answer the question on test day. So I've gone ahead and removed those. And then we will begin with the lead in. Which of the following abnormalities is most likely present in this patient? Which of the following abnormalities is most likely present in this patient? Once we read the lead-in, we'd like to ask our students the steps they believe this question will require. And we do that because we want you to have an organized thought process. And we read the lead-in first because we want you to know what the test writer is asking. This way, when you're reading the vignette, you're able to pick up on all of those relevant clues without having to reread the question and waste valuable time on test day. So I'll give all of you a few moments here to respond in the question box and let us know how many steps you believe this question will require. And then we'll go ahead and move on to that vignette. I see some responses coming in. So let's go ahead and take a look at that vignette. A 30 year old man is brought to the emergency department by emergency medical services with 24 hours of headache, nausea, dizziness, confusion, and increasing somnolence. Emergency Medical Services reports the patient has been using a kerosene heater over the past several days to keep him warm. Temperature is 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Pulse is 98 per minute and physical examination is significant for confusion and somnolescence. Which of the following abnormalities is most likely present in this patient? I want all of you to start thinking about the important clues in the vignette and lead-in as I hand it off to Paris. Thank you, Sean. So we are going to go ahead and show you what we think are the important clues in this vignette and the lead-in. Okay. So starting off with the vignette, in this case, we have a 30-year-old male. Okay. Generally, that's going to be uh, the first thing they give you are demographics. And it's always important to make note of that because that's gonna help guide your thinking and gonna help guide your differential diagnosis, okay? So 30 year old man, then they're gonna tell you usually, you know, what's going on with him. In this case, he's got some headache, nausea, dizziness, confusion, and somnolence, okay? And then they also may tell you time frame. Is this acute like this? Is it 24 hours? Is it chronic? Has it been going on for months, okay? Um, in this case, they give us a little bit more about social history, about what was happening over the last few weeks, last few days, sorry. So important to make note of that, a very important clue there. So then they're asking about the abnormality most likely present in this patient, okay? So how many steps is this question? Well, I think probably a two step. I think one, we need to figure out what's going on with this patient, what's the condition or diagnosis. And then two, what is an abnormality we may see in that patient? So a two step question. So let's go ahead, let's take a look at those answer choices. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna start at the bottom and we're gonna work our way up to the top, okay? So I'm gonna read the answer choices from E and work my way up to A. And the reason we recommend that students do that is because a lot of times we'll see students who, you know, they'll start at the top, they'll see something they like and they'll select it, but they haven't gone through all the choices, so they may actually get that wrong, okay? So we recommend doing it this way to prevent yourself from biasing yourselves and prevent yourself from making that mistake. So we're gonna go ahead and do that now. Answer choice E, decreased partial pressure of arterial oxygen. D, decreased delivery of oxygen to the tissues. C, decreased binding affinity of oxygen to hemoglobin. B, decreased alveolar oxygen pressure. And A, an increase in offloading of oxygen and tissues. 
So we're going to go ahead and open up that poll. Go ahead and select the answer choice you think is the best answer, and we'll talk about it in just a few seconds. Excellent. Thank you, Boris. Yes, the poll is open. We'll wait until about two-thirds of you have responded. Keep in mind that there is no penalty for guessing on test day. You should never leave a question blank. And if you're here tonight, you should participate and participate with active learning. It'll help you get the most out of tonight's session. So even if you're unsure, don't worry. Take your best guess. All of the responses are completely anonymous. And we will go over the correct and incorrect answers here in just a moment. I see the responses coming in. There seems to be a clear favorite, but we'll go ahead and give all of you a few more moments here to submit your responses. All right, let's take a look and see what all of you selected. Looks like the clear favorite was answer choice C with 62% of you selecting decreased binding affinity of oxygen to hemoglobin. In second place, distant second place with 30% was decreased delivery of oxygen to the tissue. So let's take a look and see what the correct answer is. And the correct answer indeed is D, decreased delivery of oxygen to the tissue. So a tough question. Let's go ahead and have it explained to us by Paris. Paris. Thank you, Sean. Yes, definitely a tough question. So let's take a look at what's going on. Okay. So here we have a young male. Okay. And he is been warming himself with a kerosene heater. Okay. So the one thing you definitely want to think about is carbon monoxide poisoning, okay? Anything involving fuel burning devices, so kerosene heaters, camping stoves, char charcoal grills, especially in a poorly vented area. So if they're doing this in an area to stay warm and if they're uh, kept their garage door closed, things like that, okay? He's got a few signs and symptoms that are suggestive of that. Headache, nausea, nausea, dizziness, and uh, confusion. Okay, so the confusion and somnolence is pretty good for carbon monoxide poisoning. Okay, so this patient would have um, elevated carboxyhemoglobin on arterial blood blood glass analysis. Okay, so what happens in the setting of carbon monoxide poisoning? Okay, so let's go ahead. Let's move on to the next slide. Sean has gone ahead and pulled up a table on our hemoglobin molecule, okay? And what ends up happening is that you can see here that there are various structures of hemoglobin, okay? And certain, that depending on the con, uh, conformity or structure, it can have a high affinity for oxygen or low affinity for oxygen, okay? And that's important because if there's a low affinity for oxygen, that means uh, it promotes release of oxygen to the tissues. On the contrary, there's a high affinity for the substance. It will hold on to it, okay? So let's move on to the next slide. And here you will see with carbon monoxide um, on the very right shift, um, or sorry, on the, on the left shift, the left side of that table, but on the, the right side of the slide. So decreased oxygen unloading to tissue. You can see there that one of the um, indications for that, or one of the, the things that would cause that, is increase in carbon monoxide, okay? So what happens is carbon monoxide, it binds to hemoglobin, and it binds to hemoglobin at the oxygen binding sites with a much higher affinity than oxygen. So think of carbon monoxide as binding to hemoglobin in the same area that oxygen does, but with a stronger affinity, okay? 250 times stronger. Okay, so what happens is that hemoglobin then chains, it changes its conformation, it changes its shape. So it does not reduce oxygen as much, or sorry, it does not offload or release oxygen as much. So the way to think about that is that, you know, if a lot of hemoglobin is bound to carbon monoxide, it's going to want to hold on to whatever little oxygen it has. It's not going to want to let go of that. Okay. Oxygen's already starting to get displaced by carbon monoxide, so it's going to want to hold on tightly to that little oxygen it does have access to. Okay, so that's a good way to think about it. So what will happen if we go back to our answer choices, you can see now how answer choice D is a correct answer. Decreased delivery of oxygen to the tissues. It's going to hold on to that oxygen. Okay, let's look at the other answer choices, why those would be incorrect. So answer choice E. 
partial pressure of arterial oxygen. This reflects the amount of oxygen gas that is directly dissolved in blood. Okay, so this actually would not be affected. There's no pulmonary pathology going on. The amount of oxygen dissolved in blood directly is actually normal. This is more of an issue with oxygen it, uh, binding the hemoglobin, okay? So E would be incorrect. C, we actually talked about how that would be increased. You have an increased binding affinity of oxygen to hemoglobin. That's why less is released at the tissues. Answer choice C, decreased alveolar oxygen pressure. This is not really what's going on. This is something you would see more so at like high altitudes or if the patient is hypoventilating. That's saying that there's more so an issue with oxygen in the air or the alveoli, which is not the case here. And then lastly, answer choice A, we talked about how there would be a decrease in offloading of oxygen to tissues, not an increase. That's the opposite here. Um, and, and A and C actually kind of go hand in hand. So if A is correct, C is likely incorrect as well, and vice versa. So D is the best answer here. Hopefully you guys understood this concept. Excellent. Thank you, Paras. Definitely a challenging question. Let's now move on to our second question of the evening. I did see a question about what the topic is for next week. Next week's topic is psychiatry, and we hope to see that. Moving on now to our second question of the evening. As you can see, the answer choices are covered up. That is by design. And we will begin once again with the lead-in. Which of the following best pairs the patient's estimated free water clearance with the most likely diagnosis? Which of the following best pairs the patient's estimated free water clearance with the most likely diagnosis? Once again, I'll give all of you a few moments here to respond in the question box and let us know how many steps you believe this question will require. And then we'll move on to the vignette. All right, I see some of the responses coming in, so let's go ahead and take a look at that vignette. A 44-year-old woman is brought to the hospital by ambulance ever after having a seizure at home. She appears disoriented. Her vital signs are within normal limits. A urine toxicology screen and finger stick glucose are normal. Laboratory analysis shows serum osmolarity of 255 and urine osmolarity of 95, with the urine volume estimated at 4 liters over 24 hours. Which of the following best pairs the patient's estimated free water clearance with the most likely diagnosis? Once again, please start thinking about the important clues in the vignette and lead-in as I hand it off to Paris. Thank you, Sean. So once again, we're going to go ahead and show you what we think are the important clues in this vignette and the lead-in. So now we have a 44-year-old woman, okay? And then a lot of times they're going to tell you, you know, what's going on. In this case, she had a seizure, and they're going to tell you, you know, where is she presenting? Is she presenting to the clinic, to the hospital, to the emergency room, okay? So we know that she's coming in by ambulance because she had a seizure, okay? They're telling us a little bit of information about um, uh, you know, some tests that were done that were normal, and then specifically some lab analysis of some osmolarity results, which I know you guys love. Um, and so obviously that's going to be important in this question um, to uh, answering this question. And, and as Sean read, we knew this was about free water clearance. So we kind of already had an idea this was going to be given to us. Um, but let's take a look. So now we're talking about that lead-in. And they're asking about us about the best pairs sorry, what best pairs the estimated free water clearance of this patient with the most likely diagnosis? So I think we've got a few steps here. I think one, we have got to uh, come up with um, an estimated free water clearance. I think we've got to come up with a most likely diagnosis as well. So I think we definitely have two steps. And I think we may just have to match those up. So it might just be two steps. Um, there may be another step in there depending on the answer choices, but we definitely have to do two things. Come up with the diagnosis and, and come up with the free water clearance, okay? So let's take a look at those answer choices. Let's see what we're working with. Okay, so once again, we have five answer choices. And so now we can see what they mean by best pairs. So they're going to give us uh, two choices here, two things going on. 
And then we've got to pair up uh, whether we think it looks like positive or negative free water clearance, and then the most likely diagnosis, okay? So let's go ahead and let's do that now. When, once again, I'm gonna start at the bottom and I'm gonna work my way up to the top. Answer choice E, positive with primary polydipsia. D, positive with diabetes insipidus. C, negative, ADH secretion by lung cancer. B, negative with volume depletion. And A, negative with thiazide associated hyponatremia. We're gonna go ahead and open up that poll. Go ahead and select the answer choice uh, that works that you think is the best answer and we'll talk about it in just a few minutes. Excellent, thank you, Paras. The poll is open. Once again, we're going to wait until about two thirds of you have responded. As always, we do have a raffle and a special offer for all of you in attendance. You must be present to win, so make sure you stick around. You could be our lucky winner tonight. All right, I see the responses coming in. We'll give all of you a few more moments here. Seems to be a clear favorite so far. All right, almost at two thirds. All right, let's take a look and see what all of you selected. In first place with 39% was positive in diabetes and sepidus. In second place, we had positive in primary polydipsia. So let's take a look and see what the correct answer is. And the correct answer is indeed E, positive with primary polydipsia. 24% of you got definitely a challenging question. And these physiology questions can be that way. But as long as you pay attention to Forrest now, you'll master this topic, Forrest. Thank you, Sean. So let's go ahead, let's take a look at this uh, question. Let's see what's going on. So what we need to do is we need to calculate this patient's free water clearance, okay? And this is the equation to calculate that. Uh, and you can see here, we if you plug and chug, um, what you wanna do is you wanna divide the urine osmolality by the plasma or serum osmolality. You wanna take, uh, subtract that from one, and then multiply that by the volume of this patient, of urine volume, and that's four liters. So that comes out to being about 2.5 liters a day, positive, okay? So this patient has a positive free water clearance, okay? So right off the bat, we know that we should be leaning towards D and E, okay? The combined low serum and urine osmolarity, less than 100, suggests that there is excess water intake and that would be more so primary polydipsia, okay? And that low sodium has led to, or sorry, the low hypoosmolarity, which would then maybe show hyponatremia, uh, probably led to the seizure and other issues, okay? So patients with polydipsia, they drink a large amount of water or other fluids, often greater than 10 liters a day, okay? Um, and it's one of only two forms of hyponatremia associated with a dilute urine. Okay, so this is most likely primary polydipsia, and we talked about how this is a positive estimated free water clearance. So that would best be answer choice E. Uh, answer choice D, diabetes insipidus. Um, that would be caused by a lack of ADH secretion or resistance to ADH, but that would present with the high plasma osmolality, the opposite of what we have here. Okay. Um, on top of a low urine osmolality and positive free water clearance. So uh, because that would present with the high plasma osmolality or serum osmolarity, that would be incorrect. Answer choices C, B, and A are incorrect because those are uh, negative uh, free water clearance, and we know this is positive free water clearance. Um, and so those would be incorrect. So we won't go too much into the other the reasons for those, because those would cause negative free water clearances. And, and as we said, this is either going to be primary polydip, polydipsia or diabetes insipidus. And then we look at the serum osmolality, and that's low, so that would be E. Excellent. Thank you, Paris. Uh, tough question, but hopefully 
you'll be able to get it right on test day now. And if you want to make sure you get it right, you can always reach out to us at Rx Coach, which is our one-on-one -on -one tutoring and coaching program. And if you uh, paid attention earlier, you saw that we have a great testimonial here with us. We have Brenda, who was one of our coaching students, and now she's, a, she's an Rx Coach. So we want to make you a success story just like that. If you're studying for board exams or a comprehensive basic science assessment, we will start you off with one of our own assessment exams. If you're in medical school, we will use your school's learning objectives and syllabus to come up with a personalized study plan. Then you'll meet with your tutor on a one-on-one -on -one basis to implement that study plan, to identify any knowledge gaps you have and bridge them and work on your test taking skills. So if you're, you know, if, if, if you want to maximize your study efforts, reach out to us. You know, a lot of students come to us and they say, you know, I've been studying, but the results don't really match my efforts. I'm putting a lot of time in, but I'm not making enough progress. Or, you know, I should have gotten that question right, but I just missed it, but I knew the answer. If any of those sound like something you've said to yourself or to your peers or colleagues, Rx Coach is here to help you. We're one of the only tutoring companies that was already in medical education prior to starting tutoring. We've got over 30 years of experience and a lot of data to back up our process. And we use that data that we've accumulated over the past several decades to use that data to help guide you on your journey, make your study more efficient, and help maximize your potential on test day. So if you want to if you want to maximize your potential, you want to do the best possible, you want to leave, you don't want to leave anything on the table when it comes to that big day, reach out to us at rx-coach or rx-coach.com. You can click on the free consultation button to discuss the program and how it can benefit you, and we can see if this program is a great fit. Of course, all of our packages do include access to all of our wonderful resources. So we encourage you to check it out at rx-coach or rx-coach.com. Without any further ado, let's go ahead and get into our third question of the evening. Once again, I want to remind all of you that next week's topic is psychiatry, and we do have a raffle, so make sure you stick around until the end because you must be present to win. All right, well, looks like you guys have the uh, work cut out for you here. Let's go ahead and begin with the lead-in. The answer choices are covered up. Which of the following best explains the observed reduction in blood pressure at the end of the study? Which of the following best explains the observed reduction in blood pressure at the end of the study? I'll give all of you a few moments here to respond in the question box and let us know how many steps you believe this question will require. And then we'll go ahead and move on to that vignette. All right, I see some responses coming in. Let's take a look at that vignette. A research study investigates the mechanism by which thiazide diuretics lower blood pressure in patients with essential hypertension. After administration of chlorothalidone to a group of 20 patients who are placed on a low sodium diet, the following effects are seen. One, fall in plasma volume with a concurrent drop in blood pressure. Two, gradual return of plasma volume to normal. Mean blood pressure is lower than before the drug was given despite the rise in plasma volume. And four, cardiac output stays at baseline in all subjects. Which of the following best explains the observed reduction in blood pressure at the end of the study? And with that, I'll hand it off to Paris. Thank you, Sean. So we're going to go ahead and show you what we think are the important uh, clues in this vignette and the lead-in. Um, so now we're talking about a research study, and we know that step one likes, likes to ask questions like this, okay? So they're investigating, as they're telling us, thiazides, okay? And then they're giving us specific effects that happened after giving chlorothalidone. Chlorothalid Okay, on a low sodium diet. Okay, so they're giving us four things that happen there. Okay, so obviously we want to make note of those four things. Okay, that's going to be important in uh, answering this question. So then they're asking us about what best explains the observed reduction in blood pressure at the end of the study. Okay, and they told us a few clues there one, two, three, four. Okay, so I think how many steps is this question? I think. Um, 
I guess it's hard to say this is a little bit of a different question. I think we've got to use all those clues and those uh, effects of the research study to figure out why the blood pressure uh, was reduced. So I think it's at least one step, but I think there's going to be a lot in that one step. Okay. So let's go ahead. Let's take a look at the answer choices. So once again, we see five answer choices, and I'm going to start at the bottom, and I'm going to work my way up to the top. Answer choice E, vasodilation. D, lower stroke volume. C, increased renal sodium reabsorption. B, decreased glomerular filtration rate. And A, arteriolar vasoconstriction. Now we'll stay on the slide for just a couple more seconds because um, now that you've seen the answer choices, make sure uh, you may want to go back and take a look at those four effects from the research study, okay? Um, so we'll stay here for a couple seconds, let you guys uh, uh, match those answer choices potentially with uh, what you saw with the study. Um, and then after a few seconds, uh, we'll then open up the poll, but um, go ahead and take a look. All right, everyone, the poll is open. Once again, we're going to wait until about two thirds of you have responded before moving on. I see the responses coming in. When you're doing questions on your own, make sure that you are reviewing not only the correct answer, but also the incorrect answers. Sometimes students get complacent and they're like, oh, I got it right and they move on. We wanna make sure you got it right for the right reasons. Now you can explain things out loud to yourself about all of the answer choices to really maximize the benefit from all the practice questions that you're doing. All right, we're about halfway there. We'll give all of you a few more moments here. Looks like a close match up here with some of the answer choices. If this is your first time attending a question live, please let us know in the question box. We'd love to hear from you. All right, looks like we're at about two thirds. So let's take a look and see what you selected. It was close. In first place with 30%, we had lower stroke volume. In close second place, we had 28% selected vasodilation. And in third place, we had increased renal sodium reabsorption. So let's take a look and see what the correct answer is. And the correct answer is indeed E, vasodilation. 28% of you got it right. Definitely some challenging questions this evening, but don't worry. Boris is here to explain it to us, and he's going to do that now. Boris. Thank you, Sean. So we're going to go ahead and uh, kind of walk through this question. So definitely a nice research study question here. So let's take a look at what's going on, okay? So thiazide diuretics, let's, well, we'll go back to that, uh, the steps there. We'll take a look. So we see that there's a fall in plasma volume and a fall in blood pressure, okay? So we know that thiazide diuretics, we know that they cause a drop in plasma volume and blood pressure, okay? Um, and we know that because it inhibits uh, uh, the DCT sodium reabsorption, okay? They also act as mild vasodilators, okay? So this combined with the reduction in plasma volume causes the antihypertensive effect, okay? So it, uh, reduces plasma volume, and it also um, would cause vasodilation, okay? So in case, you know, you didn't know that fact, how else could you have come to this answer choice? Well, let's look at the other answer choices. Lower stroke volume, okay? You know, that could account for the lower blood pressure, but they told us that cardiac output stays at baseline. So we know that if stroke volume decreased, cardiac output would have changed because cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume, okay? So that's incorrect. Answer choice C, increased renal sodium reabsor reabsorption. This would actually increase blood pressure and increase plasma volume. So that's incorrect. Answer choice B, decreased GFR. This would decrease renal water and sodium excretion and actually raise blood pressure and raise plasma volume as well. So also incorrect. And then arteriolar vasoconstriction, this would raise blood pressure as well, okay? 
So answer choice A, B, and C would all raise plasma volume and raise blood pressure. Um, lower stroke volume could, in theory, account for the lower blood pressure, but as they told us with the effect number four, cardiac output stayed at baseline. So unlikely to be a change in stroke volume, okay? So always nice to use those other clues and the effects of research study to kind of piece things together, and this was a good example of that. Excellent. Thank you, Boris. Once again, that was a tough question. Let's move on now to our fourth and last question of the evening. Let's try to finish strong and make sure you stick around until the end because, like I said, we do have a raffle and a special offer. So here we go. Once again, the answer choices have been removed, and we will begin with the lead in. Which of the following ion channels is most responsible for the observed arrhythmia? Which of the following ion channels is most responsible for the observed arrhythmia? I'll give all of you a few moments to respond in the question box and let us know how many steps you believe this question will require. Then we'll go ahead and move on to the vignette. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at that vignette. A 71-year-old woman comes to the physician for a routine examination. She says she feels well. She has a history of diabetes, mellitus, and hypertension, well controlled on metformin and enalapril. The ECG is shown. Which of the following ion channels is most responsible for the observed arrhythmia? I'll give all of you a few moments to take a look at the important keywords in the lead and end vignette as I hand it off to Boris. Thank you, Sean. So we're going to go ahead and show you what we think are the important clues in this vignette in the lead in. So we've done that a few times now. So hopefully you guys are starting to get a sense of really what's important in the vignette. What are those clues uh, to really help answer the question? And what are some things that you know you don't necessarily need to highlight? So you can save your time if you need to go back and read the question, okay? So in this case, uh, case now we're dealing with an older patient, 71-year-old woman. They tell us a little bit about her medical and medication history, and then they're giving us an EKG, okay? So we know that an EKG is obviously gonna be very important. They're then asking us which ion channel is most responsible for the observed arrhythmia. So I think we've got a couple steps here. I think one, we've got to figure out what is the diagnosis, what's the arrhythmia, the, uh, the observed arrhythmia that's going on, and then what ion channel is responsible um, for that. Um, and I actually, I think you could take this another step. I think um, uh, what is the arrhythmia? What is the observed arrhythmia? Two, what causes, like, what is, where is the defect? What is the issue in that arrhythmia? And then three, what ion channel is responsible for that? So I think we might actually have three steps here, okay? So let's go ahead, let's take a look at those answer choices. And once again, now we have a nice high yield uh, image of this EKG. Make sure you're taking a nice, good look at this, okay? Um, so now we're going to go ahead and take a look at those answer choices. Answer choice E, transient T-type calcium channels. D, potassium protein channels. C, fast voltage-gated sodium channels. B, cyclic nucleotide-gated funny cation channels. And A, L-type calcium channels. So we're going to go ahead and open up that answer poll. Make, uh, go ahead and select the answer choice you think is the best answer. We'll talk about it in just a few seconds. Excellent. Thank you, Boris. This is our fourth and last question of the evening. Let's try to finish strong. The poll is open. And as always, we will wait until about two-thirds of you have responded before moving on. Remember that even if you are unsure of your answer choice, take your best guess and we'll learn from Boris together here in just a moment. I 
see the responses coming in. We'll give all of you a few more seconds here. All right. Well, let's go ahead and take a look and see what all of you selected. In first place, we had answer choice D with 35% of you selecting potassium protein channels. In second place, with 19%, we had cyclic nucleotide-gated funny cation channels. So let's take a look and see what the correct answer is. And the correct answer is B, cyclic nucleotide-gated funny cation channels. And 19% of you got it right. So definitely another challenging question. So let's all pay attention to Boris now. Boris. Thank you, Sean. So definitely a tough question. So let's see what's going on here. So if we take a look at that EKG, okay, what we can see there is sinus bradycardia, okay? That heart rate is about 40, 45, 48, okay? And if you look at the space between those QRS complexes, you can see that they're pretty wide, okay? So between each QRS complex, that's a lot of space, okay? And you can use certain various tips and tricks to you know, looking at the number of big boxes between uh, the R's uh, of the various QRX complexes, and you can see that that comes out to about 48, uh, 45 beats per minute, okay? So this is sinus bradycardia, okay? Um, and so you, know, you can see that in people who are very well conditioned, people who are runners, if they take certain medications like beta blockers, okay? or if they're elderly as well, okay? And some of the other causes of sinus bradycardia include sinoatrial or SA node disease, okay? So an issue with the pacemaker of the heart, okay? So the heart rate is determined by the SA node, and a lot of pathologic causes of sinus bradycardia involve diseases of this pacemaker, okay? So let's go ahead, let's take a look at the next slide. What you'll see here, is that uh, the SA node is made up of these pacemaker cells, okay? And these pacemakers have action potentials that are different than your cardiac myocytes, okay? So it's important to keep that in mind. Myocyte action potential, pacemaker action potential, okay? And what ends up determining the automaticity is uh, the funny cation channels. You can see there at the bottom, labeled IF, the sodium potassium, okay? The slope of that phase four determines the heart rate. So if your funny current is increased or de decreased, and the slope of that phase four is increased or decreased, that will change the heart rate, okay? So in a patient with potential bradycardia, these would be the channels that would be affected that would cause a prolonged heart rate, okay? So hopefully you guys are uh, picking up on why this would be the correct uh, channel channels involved. Um, so the first step here was diagnosing that this was bradycardia, knowing what channels or what phase of the pacemaker action potential this would be involved with. And three, what are the channels involved in that phase four, okay? So let's go back to the other answer choices, see why those are incorrect. Answer choice E, the T-type calcium channels. Uh, this is not responsible uh, for um, the, the depolarization that takes place during an action potential um, and do not determine the heart rate, so not the best answer here. Answer choice D, uh, these allow for membrane repolarization, also not involved in heart rate determination. C, this has more to do with the depolarization of cardiac myocytes, not action potential, or sorry, not pacemaker action potential cells. And then lastly, answer choice A. Um, this has more to do with uh, um, the depolarization of the, the, uh, for the action potential, and again, does not involve determination of heart rate. So again, less likely to be the correct answer there. Um, so definitely some tough, challenging physiology questions today. Hopefully you guys were able to learn on a few things and learn how to dissect these questions. And I'll pass it back to you, Sean.
Well, thank you very much, Boris. Yes, definitely some challenging questions. And if you want to review these questions on your own time to get some more clarity and make sure you understand everything, just jot down or take a screenshot or a picture of these QIDs. And when you log into USMLE Rx, you can simply type these into the Rx search field and review them in more detail.